Thank you all for coming. And thank you for joining us online. My name is Brian Wallace. I'm executive director at the Center for Photography at Woodstock, also known as CPW. Uh, one of our goals here at CPW is to encourage and elicit conversation and criticism around photography, and in particular, photography and its social impact. And probably nobody I can think of has done more to chronicle photography and its social impact over the last 40 years than our speaker tonight, Marvin Heiferman. Marvin is a writer, curator, publisher, and really one of the great thinkers in the field of photography. In particular, he has focused on photography and visual culture and its political, social, and personal influence. Uh, for example, his exhibition in 1989 at the Whitney Museum was called Image World, took that big topic and looked at contemporary art and photography in relation to media and its propagation. In 1999, he did an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art called, called Fame After Photography, which looked at the coincidental rise of photography in the 19th and early 20th century and its impact on the rise of celebrity. And in 2019, we were lucky enough to have um, Marvin and his husband, Maurice Berger, do an exhibition at CPW called The Searchers, which was an early exhibition that looked at race, identity, and racism in American culture. So he's an important contributor, not only to the field of photography, but also to CPW. Uh, a second reason why this is a very special evening is um, Marvin will talk, as you may know, about the sad death of his husband, Maurice Berger, uh, an extremely important cultural critic and writer uh, who did a lot to investigate race in American culture, including uh, exhibitions and monographs on Adrian Piper and Fred Wilson, uh, and also an important ongoing series of monthly articles in the New York Times called Race Stories. He was one of the first victims of COVID, sadly. And since that time, Marvin has done an incredible task of remembering every single day Maurice's life in posts on Instagram. And that's what he's gonna talk with us about today. It's a very moving project. And we really thank Marvin for sharing it with us tonight. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Brian. Thank you all for coming here um, tonight. And yeah, what a perfect way to start slideshows. <laughs> it's great. Um, I'm going to be talking about this Instagram project that I did. I'm going to be reading it because it's pretty fraught to talk about this. So bear with me. Um, um, I never intended to make most of the photographs you're going to see today. Starting in 2014, I was taking different sorts of pictures and posting one each day to Instagram. Photographs of odd but beautiful things, photographs about the nature and the act of observation itself. The people who paid attention to them were, for the most part, people who liked to look at and think about looking and the ways the photographs work. Photographers, artists, curators, writers, editors, and publishers. My husband, Maurice Berger, a noted writer and curator and cultural historian, was one of them. As 2020 began, I was working on an outline for what I thought my next book was going to be, which was about Instagram and how photo sharing was impacting global visual culture. But soon, another phenomenon, a worldwide pandemic, intervened. 
in the early months of 2020, before the aerosol spread of coronavirus was better understood and mask wearing became widespread, Maurice and I carried little spray bottles of rubbing alcohol and hand sanitizers everywhere we went and used them vigilantly. The first case of COVID-19 in New York State was confirmed on March 1st. On March 11th, the World Health Organization declared the pandemic. On March 12th, an infect as infection rates spread and death counts surged and Manhattan started to lock down, Maurice and I decided that we would head to our house in upstate New York, uh, thinking we would be safer. And we were for a while. Like many others, we made repeated trips to the supermarket to stock up on supplies, not knowing how long we were going to have to shelter at home. On March 15th, when we were walking around the Roosevelt Historic Site in Hyde Park, Maurice took a picture of me taking a picture, posted it to Instagram later that day, and captioned it. Marvin, not missing the opportunity to photograph something. It was the last photograph he would take. On March 16th and 17th, he said he felt tired. On March 18th, he woke up with a fever. And as the sun set on March 22nd, I was in a state of shock, staring at first responders, standing idly by a medevac helicopter that had been summoned, but that Maurice, who had just been declared dead, never made it on. Maurice died of COVID-related illness, but the locally elected town coroner and a medical examiner, not knowing or not wanting to deal with this, stonewalled me and refused to swab Maurice's body. I was dumbstruck and inarticulate. If words were failing me, it turned out that photography wouldn't. When I came home to an empty house, Instagram was the last thing on my mind. Three days later, in realizing I had to get out of the house, I went for a walk down the road where, next to a tiny ramshackle house, an American flag hung on the tree. We're, we're frozen. <laughs> hey. There we go. Okay. I'd passed it hundreds of times before, but that day what caught my eye was that the flag was twisted around its pole. It looked fucked up. I felt fucked up. And because the flag matched the way I felt, I took a picture of it. I uploaded the picture to Instagram and went to sleep in the bedroom next to ours because I couldn't bear to set foot in the room where three days earlier... I went to um, I went to sleep in the room um, ne next to ours because I couldn't bear to set foot in the room where three days earlier I'd followed CPR instructions of a 9/11 dispatcher I had on speakerphone until EMS workers burst into our house and took over. After Maurice died, I could barely eat or sleep, but I thought taking pictures and posting them on Instagram, as I usually did, might be something that could ground me. But now, instead of the, oh, wow, look at this, isn't this interesting kind of pictures that came to me so easily in the past, the photographs I found myself making visualized in one way or another the very, very vulnerable state I was in. I was never one to wear my feelings on my sleeve, but that's what I started to do visually and daily. The pandemic was uploading lives in multiple ways, was upending lives in, in multiple ways. Anxiety, fear, and grief were inescapable. And to my surprise, people started looking and commenting on the photos in numbers I was unaccustomed to, and more importantly, with unexpected kindness and concern. On a social media platform known for the relentless branding of happiness, I became a grief guy, posting images of my 24-7 sadness, confusion, and the one foot in front of another mode that I was operating in. Grief experts talk about the fact that grief needs to be witnessed, and they're right. Instagram gave me a place to shape the heartbreaking sense of absence that I was up against into some kind of presence. The picture day regimen helped me confront my isolation and fragile state and clear a path through weeks, then months, then years when I, like so many others, lost track of time. I gradually came to understand that I was doing two things, telling a story about Maurice and me and a parallel story about photography, love, death, memory, and politics. 
And for all the media coverage of the pandemic, uh, there were still many people who didn't personally know somebody who had died of COVID, so now they did. Maurice and I loved pictures, adored each other, and once we'd gotten together, edited every word of each other's written work. I was, and I still am, in awe of the brilliance and bravery and accessibility of his writing, and how clearly Maurice could comprehend the bigger picture and tease out the subtleties of every subject he turns its attention to. His 1990 essay, Are Art Museums Racist in Art in America, was provocative enough to get Maurice fired from a teaching position he had at Hunter College, but it's now acknowledged as a foundational work in the fields of race, representation, and museum studies. For all the world to see the 2011 exhibition he curated for the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture was so revelatory in exploring the roles photography played in the civil rights movement that versions of the show traveled around the country for a decade. White Lies is a beautifully written book that Maurice, uh, in which Maurice revisits the pivotal events and encounters in his life that led him to become acutely aware of his own whiteness. Both a memoir and a call to action, it challenges readers to acknowledge the origins and consequences of their own racial attitudes. And I'm working now on editing a volume of the award-winning essays Maurice wrote for his New York Times column, Race Stories, between 2012 and 2018. What's curious to me now, in retrospect, is that for two people whose lives revolved so much around photographic imagery, we gave so little thought to taking pictures of each other, or at all, for that matter, during the first 15 years of our life together. It was only after I got a digital point-and-shoot camera in 2007 that I began to do both, but fitfully. And it wasn't until 2014 that I decided to give Instagram a try. I got hooked quickly. The social media app is, much of the time, an enjoyable one to post to and scroll through. I came to rely on Instagram differently, though, after Maurice's death. It became a place to explore private grief in a public arena. What I loved about Maurice, him about me, what we loved about us. Doing my best to understand photography's relationship to memory, hoping to reconcile my widowed presence in Maurice's absence, turned into a humbling and unexpected, unexpectedly useful experience. Look at the pictures on Instagram and you'll learn some things about Maurice and me. Read the captions that accompany the photographs and you'll learn a little bit more. Background information that sometimes describes or hints at things that are tricky to picture. But nothing you see there will fully communicate Maurice's intellect, his sweetness, both how critical and supportive he could be, how perceptive and how funny he was. No pictures will depict the difficult circumstances in his early life or the resolve that it took for him to rise above them. You'll see Maurice pictured by someone who was amazed, amused by, and head over heels in love with him. And one other thing you need to know is that while I posted over 1,200 images on Instagram since Maurice died, I wish I'd made thousands and thousands and thousands more of him and of the two of us when he was alive. The person I remember to talking to at dusk on the chilly March evening Maurice died was a state trooper. I was parked at the edge of a driveway that leads to what's now a religious temple that not long ago was a rundown motel. Maurice was in the ambulance straight ahead where medics tried to keep him breathing. I was terrified and silent. A young state trooper's job was to elicit a statement from me about what brought all of those assembled to the site. And because COVID at that point was such an unknown, I wanted to be precise about what Maurice went through over the past five days because from all we'd seen and heard and read, it was clear to me that COVID was what we were dealing with. It was the same state trooper who not too much later approached the car, this time with his head down, to tell me Maurice had died. I got out of the car so shaky that I had to lean against it to make three phone calls to family, to friends, to Maurice's doctor at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Someone else came over to ask what to do with Maurice's body. In shock and with no idea what the options were, when a local funeral home was suggested, I agreed to it. Following Maurice's doctor's advice, I requested an autopsy be conducted, but was repeatedly told it was not my choice to make. 
Things didn't get any easier when the Columbia County Department of Health called to say it was urgent that I get tested because there were no tests available. It took three days for an extraordinarily empathetic and determined communicable disease nurse to figure out how to secure an appointment for me in an adjacent county, which actually was in Kingston, where I got tested. And despite the frenzied national demand for testing, when I arrived at the sprawling drive through setup in the parking field of an abandoned IBM facility, a surreal vista lay ahead. A maze of hundreds of orange traffic cones to find the long snaking route in, and mine was the only car there. I was the only person to be tested as dozens and dozens of masked and gowned healthcare workers stood by idle. It took two weeks for the results to come back negative. As I'd had no COVID symptoms by that point, I was neither shocked nor relieved. What did startle me, though, was how rapidly news of Maurice's death spread. On Monday, March 23rd, the day after he died, an art critic with a vast online following tweeted out the news. And on Tuesday, the call started flooding in, and it dawned on me that I was simultaneously dealing with public as well as private grief. On Wednesday morning, March 25th, I woke to over 300 emails in my inbox and felt as if I'd been knocked over by a tsunami. And I tried at first to dutifully work my way through them one by one because I was so touched by people's kindness and reaching out to me and how sensitively crafted the messages they, of condolence that they sent were. The problem was it was taking me 45 minutes to an hour to craft a response to any single one of them because every email only seemed to reinscribe Maurice's death. And so I gave up. In Notes on Grief, an essay from 2020, the writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie explained, you learn how much grief is about language, the failure of language, and the grasping for language. Why that is the case was further clarified for me by Denise Riley, a poet and a philosopher who in a brief and really brilliant book called Time Lived Without Its Flow, describes how those left behind and devastated by a sudden death often feel that they, like those who have died, have been ripped out of time too, and are left to live inside a great circle with no rim. For weeks after Maurice died, I sat in a chair and stared outside. There was nothing I could do or wanted to do, nowhere I wanted to go, nothing I looked at or thought about that didn't remind me about Maurice. As the lockdown deepened, haunted by what, I'd saw, what I saw Maurice go through, trips out of the house, even to the supermarket, were fraught with anxiety and risk. If every day of lockdown seemed the, seemed the same, I felt a need to post a new picture to, or to repurpose one from the past to mark time, to represent the destabilized state of mind I was in, and that life did not go on for Maurice, but did for me. The taking, looking at, and sharing of pictures became primal and urgent, a survival strategy that enabled me to toggle between the past and the present, to be in touch with and step back from grief, and to think about what it meant to stay in a world um, that I wasn't sure I wanted to be in. And Instagram, to my surprise, turned out to be the best place for me to do all of that. I didn't know or care at first if people looked or not. What mattered was representing my own experiences directly as I could and as honestly as I could. Thinking about taking and selecting which pictures to post became the only important decision I felt I needed to make on any given day, a break from sadness I otherwise couldn't shake, even if sadness itself was what I was trying to picture. Because grief is not orderly, but comes and goes, because I was unable to imagine a future. There was no way for the photos on Instagram to tell a story with a conventional trajectory or narrative. Time for Maurice was over. Time for me had liquefied. One more reason to grasp it, freezing it, and trying to find solace in still photographs. I went through tens of thousands of photographs on my phone and hard drive, searching for pictures of Maurice or even traces of him in pictures where he wasn't the ostensible subject. Every day revolved around the challenge. What picture would remind me or suggest to anyone looking who Maurice was, what he did, said, liked, wore, ate, worried about, or wanted? What picture could I find, take, or fabricate that might represent or suggest Maurice's intense presence, 
the way he looked, the way he sounded, the way he moved, the way he joked around, the care and concentration he focused on the people and things that he loved the most. Maurice was no longer physically present, but I had and still have startlingly, startlingly vivid and embodied memories of him moving around and through space, working um, in bed or at his desk, typing on his phone in the car, walking into rooms, walking across parking lots, standing or sitting next to me with his arm around my shoulder. Without an archive of surveillance footage to access, sometimes the best I could do is make photographs that evoked his Mauriceness. I posted pictures of things I found in his pockets and drawers and closets. Sometimes they made me laugh and smile, but other things that I came across and photographed made me incredibly sad. Like, whoops, like this. The digital thermometer Maurice ordered on March 18th when he had a fever, the first day he had one that arrived at our house two weeks after he died. Or the sneakers I'd bought for him as an early birthday present months before the May 2020 birthday he wouldn't live to see, still neatly lined up on the floor next to the, nap pack, the, the knapsack he'd never carry again. I photographed the now empty front passenger seat in the car, Maurice's side of the bed, all of them exercises in magical thinking, hoping that somehow, some way, they would not only conjure him up, but bring him back. And I posted pictures of me often in tears, thinking those thoughts. On more mornings than I realized, I take virtually the same picture over and over again in a poignant exercise and futile attempt to keep Maurice alive. First time was on April 27th, 2020, a month after Maurice died. It's an offhand shot I made from the side of the kitchen, from one side of the kitchen to the other, seen from the table where I drink coffee, read the news, and was often at work hours before Maurice woke up. But the part of the picture that's most significant is the upper right-hand corner, which shows the empty doorway I'd eye each morning, waiting for Maurice to appear, appear and pass through it. I made this picture and near-identical versions of it at least a dozen times afterwards, obsessively, because I wanted Maurice to walk through that doorway again and so badly. Thirteen months after Maurice's death, and in the process of going through every photo on my hard drive yet one more time, I gasped when I found that I had, in fact, already taken the picture that I was wishing I could make. Shot in 2019, Maurice appears on the upper right side of the image, half awake, with bedhead hair, and looking slightly surprised at me to taking a picture of him and doing what I was doing. So I got my wish, but I shook my head in disbelief. I looked at the picture, looked away, and looked again. Maurice was there, but he was never coming back. There are other scenes I remember as intensely, but for which there are no images. Many of them are sweet ones, but seared into my memory, too, is one uncaptured image, a horrible one, a close-up view. It's the blank look I saw in Maurice's eyes on the day that he died, when I walked into our bedroom thinking he might be asleep and then realizing he wasn't, screamed out his name, hoping to wake him up. I lifted his body, I looked at his face, and it was the same look I'd seen on Maurice's face once before in a 2016 emergency room visit that turned into a medical nightmare that he barely survived. The memory of that look back then kept returning unexpectedly in flashbacks over the next four years, something I wouldn't tell Maurice about for the longest time because I didn't want him to revisit what had transpired or to feel responsible for its impact on me. And now I saw that look again. Little is known about those sorts of recurrent intrusive images, but they're among the criteria used to describe post-traumatic stress disorder. And, yeah. No, it's a it's a blank slide. <laughs> this is what this is what I couldn't bear to look at. <laughs> there is no picture. Yeah, but thanks. Yeah, um, little is known about these sorts of recurrent intrusive images, but they're among the criteria used to describe post traumatic stress disorder. What makes them so disorienting is that they are experienced as though they are happening in the present and not as something recalled. That's why for years I'd be thrown off guard when that image of Maurice's two open eyes would pop up in my mind's eye. It could happen while I was driving, 
cooking, watching TV, lying in bed, or looking at the wide open eyes of some of the toys that I bought Maurice because he had so few toys when he was a kid. Among the treatments employed to help people deal with recurrent traumatic images is a technique known as exposure therapy in which after repeated encounters with triggering images, patients learn to recognize and gradually become desensitized to their hypnotic grip. It crossed my mind in the process of making these pictures for Instagram that photography's relationship to death dates back to the medium's origin in the 19th century. When post-mortem photographs functioned as tools of exposure therapy to help the living cope with the trauma of death. Not long after I started up uploading pictures to Instagram, it dawned on me I might be doing something similar by and for myself. It helped me sometimes to take pictures of and in spaces where Maurice's energy and spirit were still fresh in my mind. Still images I'd post made when Maurice was alive can be both wonderful and difficult for me to look at. Their thereness, my memory of taking them, the history encoded in them is tangible, intense, and often at odds with Maurice's literal goneness. When I'd walk by places where Maurice sat, like his green chair in the living room, I'd sigh deeply. In the days and nights after Maurice died, two questions kept ricocheting in my head. What the fuck just happened? And more indicative of my state of denial, joke, right? No joke. I was, I realized, feeling bad for a dead person, for all the things Maurice hoped for and looked forward to doing but never would. And I knew, of course, that I was feeling bad for myself, the pieces of me that Maurice saw better and more clearly than I did. In a profound poem called Epigraph that Farce Gander addressed to his late wife, the poet C.D. Wright, he wrote, you existed me. There is, he explains, no sequel to the very specific kind of loss one feels when the person who loves you the most, who knows you the best, dies. You see me, he wrote, as I would never be revealed. One more thing to be sad about. My sense of loss was complicated by the fact that the landscape of loss grew as COVID spread, as responses to it were tested, bungled, sabotaged, and politicized, as borders, cities, economies, and classrooms went silent. I was infuriated by Donald Trump's frequent and misleading public statements, evidence of his administration and followers' willful denial of science and life-saving protocols that poured accelerant on a health crisis already spinning out of control. I read news stories on my phone every morning. I watched hour after hour of cable news on a big flat screen every evening where I encountered heartbreaking images of people dying and mourning alone, overworked healthcare professionals, refrigerator trucks repurposed as temporary morgues of scientists at podiums trying to explain the facts they knew at the moment, of politicians at podiums defying science and as a result condemning hundreds of thousands to death. Reminders of what I survived and Maurice did not alternatively enraged and paralyzed me. The most I could muster up was energy, was the energy for or to commit to was representing in photographs as best as I could, whatever I found myself confronted with. And in the process of posting those pictures to Instagram, I grasped something else, something essential. Grief needs to be expressed. The death shapes the grief, David Kessler, a grief expert, said in one podcast that I listened to. And then he went on to pinpoint something I'd intuitively set in motion, but had not been able to articulate to myself. Our grief needs to be witnessed, he said. We need to have our pain witnessed. Knowing that, day after day, people were looking at the images I shared and the captions I wrote was comforting. I, like others, needed company and consolation. As the number of COVID cases and deaths rose, as hospital facilities were stretched beyond limit, and before vaccines became available, grief in all of its varieties became widespread, too widespread to be siloed or to be silenced. Growing numbers of people began to experience what's called ambiguous or disenfranchised grief, the loss of things like routines and jobs, which are not often publicly mourned. Worse was the spread of anticipatory grief, the gnawing anxiety that wells up when there's no way to gauge what the future will bring. 
And for those who come into direct contact with COVID, things were even bleaker. A November 2020 CDC study of 800 American adults who'd lost someone to COVID found two thirds of them to be suffering from debilitating levels of grief. I knew the photographs I was posting to Instagram were helpful to me. They were helping me investigate my personal grief. What I didn't anticipate was how they would resonate with others, many of whom wrote to express their concern and support and share their own experiences. Hi, Marvin. I've been following your Instagram for a while, reading and feeling your grief and processing. It's been beautiful to read the shared love between you and Maurice. I was at Club Q during the recent mass shooting there on the 19th. I lost my partner, Daniel Davis Aston, that night and got out alive myself. Reading your post this evening hit me with such poignancy. I had always in some way related to your words of loss and being so deeply in love with the other person you've chosen to share space with. But now your words I can see matching my own. Thank you for sharing your grief. It's allowing me to acknowledge the rough moments and to love dearly and hold close the wonderful memories shared, sending you lots of love from Colorado Springs, Colorado. At the Mayo Clinic with my husband, just thought to look at your old post. Not sure why, I never thought of it before. Your posts early on are exactly how I imagine I'll feel, hopefully very far in the future. I've had to stop. I'm crying for you and me. This feels unbearable and my love is still with me. The anticipatory grief is killing me. I lost my husband in 2015. We were just ordinary people who loved each other and tried to build a life together. We were together for 20 years. It's been a rough road, and although the edges have softened, the struggle remains, my secret pain. Your posts help, and I'm thankful for them. Here's to life and what we and many others are able to do with it. I don't know whether it's your, point, your post or what. I haven't remembered my dreams in forever. I walked by you and you were sitting on some steps. I saw Maurice, I guess, uh, Maurice is, I guess, soul or ghost sitting next to you. I told you I could see him. You were surprised as I guess usually just you could see. Sorry, didn't mean to overshare, but I think it was a good thing. It takes time in the realm of years, but those memories that cut to the soul change. At some point, they start to comfort and bring a smile, memories that hearten and fulfill instead of being full of grief. Or maybe it's just that grief changes. I don't know. I didn't notice it happening. I just realized one day that it had. In 2020 and 2021, as in-person gatherings migrated to Zoom, they were reconstituted as camera-based talking heads events. People were relieved to see and connect with one another again, but what kept them apart, fear, infection, hospitalizations, and death rates rising were impossible to ignore. Unable to hold or attend funerals, people were left to figure out how to mourn and cope with loss, largely on their own. In an April 2020 New York Times article, Jody Cantor wrote, when the hour calls for togetherness, we will be apart. These kinds of catastrophes are what push us forward in our mourning rituals. And now we are poised to make another leap, finding new ways to signal sorrow. We see a rise in creative bereavements, a British researcher explained. Millions of people are dying, but mobile phones are the vehicle to make those people more real, to use these spaces to create eulogies, to record and take pictures. Because Maurice died so early in the pandemic when holding a funeral was beyond the realm of possibility, I made the decision to have his body cremated. What I couldn't summon up the courage to do was go alone to collect his ashes. When I was finally ready, my friend Dan and I drove to the funeral home in separate cars to avoid being together in a tight enclosed space. When we arrived, we put on masks, walked in, and the woman I dealt with previously on the phone stepped towards us. She was maskless. She placed the small heavy box of Maurice's remains on a table in front of me, then handed me a folder of release forms to be signed. While I registered the fact that she was unmasked, I was too distracted and upset with what needed to be done to comment on it. Dan wasn't, and he said, you're not wearing a mask. COVID's a hoax, the woman replied assertively and repeatedly. No one dies of COVID. People die of underlying condition. COVID's a hoax. 
trying to control myself, but wanting to stop her from saying that again and again. I explained that Maurice may have had underlying conditions, but his health was good. He would never have died if it wasn't for COVID. COVID's a hoax, she said one last time before going silent. It took over a month to process what happened that day, but once I did, I knew what to do. I drove to the funeral home, took a picture, wrote a caption explaining the unsettling encounter, and posted both on Instagram at 5 p.m. What happened next took me by surprise. The next morning, the funeral director phoned me, clearly shaken, to tell me that he'd been besieged by scores of irate local, national, and international phone calls, voicemails, and emails, all of them criticizing his employees' insensitivity and questioning his businesses, practices, ethics, and integrity. Flummoxed, he kept apologizing for what happened. And when I asked him if he'd spoken with his employee about the inappropriateness of her remarks and actions, he assured me she'd no longer be in a position where that could happen again, but wouldn't get specific about what that meant. In closing, he talked about how his was a local business, that we lived in the same community, and he asked that when I felt up to it, I'd give him a call, meet for a drink, and let bygones be bygones. I said, sure, I never have, and I never will. Quite a few emails and notes I received in the weeks after Maurice's death ended with one variant or another of a Jewish saying, may the memory be a blessing. But remembering Murray's back then and for a long while was agonizing. All I could do was lament his goneness. That was the case when one day in July 2020, I was, I, just, I was driving to New York and decided that every time I thought about Maurice, I noted on the index card I placed in my shirt pocket for that purpose. It happened 60 times that day from the time I awoke until the time I fell asleep. It was photography, it turned out, that would be the blessing. The pictures I made function as springboards and at their best enable me to rise above the clouds of loss hanging around me. They help me revisit Maurice's hearness. I'd see articles of clothing Maurice wore, for example, and think about where and when and why he bought them and what it looked like when he put them on or when he took them off. I'd read the nuances of his facial expression and body language, and after a quarter of a century together, had a pretty good sense of what was on his mind or in his heart. I'd look at 2D pictures of Maurice, and I'd read them as three-dimensional. I see him alive. After Maurice died, I was struck and then overwhelmed by the fact that our life together had come to an end, that it was like a beautiful place we had visited and that there was no going back to it. The blessing is that there are photographs of it. And while I was have very specific and still troublesome memories of the last five days of Maurice's life, my recollection of the next five next few years was spotty. From the first pandemic year into the second, I felt like I was at best treading water. And as testing as vaccines became more widely available and some officials cautiously hinted at light at the end of the tunnel, Maurice's favorite season, spring, came around. Various cultures propose different schedules for grief's expression and management, as do the mental health specialists who understand that grief's progression is not, an easy, it's not easy to diagram or a one-size-fits-all one experience. I knew after one year passed that I was still grieving, but I was looking at and making pictures about the experience from a little bit more of a distance. In another podcast I listened to, the psychotherapist Megan Devine, when asked about her relationship to a void in her life, left by her husband's sudden death, changed over time, she responded, in the early days, that pit is everything, and you're barely on the edge of it. One of the things that time does is give you a little bit more of a sidewalk around the pit. That leeway, I understood immediately, was what photography, as well as time, was giving to me. The reality in 2021 was that agreeing on what the new normal would be was impossible, because in the lulls between one COVID variant and the next, goalposts kept changing. Things, things seemed to get better, then they didn't. Misinformation about COVID spread by the opportunistic and conspiracy-minded metastasized. 
containment and mitigation strategies, vaccination, testing, masking, social distancing, monitoring safe returns to public spaces were rigor rigorously adhered to by some and defiantly challenged by others across America's splintered civic landscape. In the early months of 2022, as Omicron's impact diminished, and then in the summer when infection rates soared again, consensus over whether COVID was becoming endemic, how that would play out, and what to do if and when new variants arose were all up in the air. Days passed, and if during some of them I thought I had a slightly better handle on what transpired or might happen next, I understood those epiphanies to be temporary. Invariably, grief would arrive again unannounced. Over time, I learned not to be so surprised or disarmed by the recurrences, but that didn't stop the flashbacks or the bouts of sadness or longing from erupting and punching holes in the present. When I'd read the expiration dates on things in the refrigerator or the pantry, I think, Maurice was alive then, or he wasn't. I'd open closet doors and drawers and see something of his and be thrown off balance. I'd go places we'd been and waves of grief would sweep over me, then drag me down into their undertow. It would take many seasons before I was able to surrender to those currents, to trust that eventually be deposited back on a shore that looks somewhat familiar. But when I was inconsolable, taking pictures became a palliative activity. I realized I was not only making pictures to visualize loss, but to build bridges over it. At some point, I came across a 1962 talk in which James Baldwin, one of Maurice's heroes, explained how and why making one's personal pain public could be of use. Well, one survives that no matter what. And what is crucial here is that if it hurt you, that is not what's important. Everybody's hurt. What's important, what corrals you, what bullwhips you, what drives you, torments you, is that you must find way, some ways of using this to connect you with everyone else alive. This is all you have to do on earth. You must understand that your pain is trivial, except insofar as you can use it to connect with other people's pain. And, and insofar as you can do that with your pain, you can be released from it. And then hopefully it works the other way around too. Insofar as I can tell you what it is to suffer, perhaps I can help you to suffer less. Making and sharing pictures of intimacy and absence became my job. The photographs reminded me, and it turns out others too, of the desires, fears, needs, strengths, failures, and limits we all have. They reminded me and others too that paying attention to and being there for one another when we face hardship helps us cope with the fact that we're alive for what is in the bigger scheme of things, a split second. Photographs made in split seconds help us frame up and see life in a different context. Recently, Pauline Boss, who writes on loss, published a book called The Myth of Closure, Ambiguous Loss in a Time of Pandemic and Change, in which she wrote, our task now after a time of so much suffering is to acknowledge our losses, name them, and find meaning in them. Instead of searching for closure, we search for a meaning and new hope. I understand her, that quest, and I understand that it will take a while. I look at photographs, I see Maurice alive in them, I know he's dead, I recognize them as sites of reconciliation as I try to figure out who I am and what to do next. It's the steepest learning curve I've ever experienced, and it continues. In the year of living, in the year of magical thinking, Joan Didion uh, laid out the territory in a challenge. Whoops. I know why we try to keep the dead alive. We try to keep them alive in order to keep them with us. I know that if we are to live ourselves, there comes a point at which we must relinquish the dead, let them go, keep them dead. Let them, she wrote, become the photograph on the table. Let them are the key words here, an action easier said than done. I'm not able or ready to let photographs just sit there because for now I'm still so actively engaged in and dependent upon them. They remain stubbornly provocative. They are not easily silenced. They won't be walk byable or peripheral until I'm ready to think differently about them and stop looking so much. I'm not ready for that, to let things be, to let things go. My unsettled life plays out and unsettles 
anxious world, in, a, in an unsettled anxious world where COVID still impinges on day-to-day -day life. What these photographs show, I hope, is that I'm doing the best I can. Something else that Pauline Boss wrote offers up what may be, for me, the single most effective incentive to keep on going. The goal may be just continuing to live with gratitude and joy because the person you love cannot. And because I loved and miss Maurice, I will. Thanks. I think we're going to, if anybody has any questions or comments, we're happy to talk about them. If not, that's fine too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily what you were thinking when you took the picture, when you were in the car and the helicopter was there. But thinking now about having taken that picture, I guess those are two separate questions. I mean, you could talk a little bit on that. In retrospect, I didn't really think about that decision. Well, I mean, I was sitting in the car dreading what was going on. I was helpless. There was nothing I could do. And I thought, I better take a picture of this. And so I took pictures of the ambulance. And then when I turned around and saw the helicopter, I, you know, I just kind of freaked. And all those people just standing around the helicopter. And I knew this, you know, I'm fucked. This is it. Um, but I took the pictures because I had nothing else to do. And I had become so reliant on on taking them to negotiate a way to move through, th through things. But I could not look at those pictures for months. I, I wouldn't look at them. And I didn't put them up for months. Yeah. But yeah, it got to the point where I thought, oh, I better document this. Yeah. Yeah. So what, uh, was your Instagram called Why We Look? Fire, and uh, if so, has your conception of why we look changed? Yeah, it's yeah. This Instagram is why we look. It's why we, you know, on Facebook, Twitter. It's uh, it's. I'm kind of fascinated by looking, you know, and, and the role that photographs play in our lives. And and you know, as I said a number of times, and what in what I was reading from tonight looking and making photographs became really important, you know, just as a way to see where I was, what was going on, and then look back at photographs and think, you know, how your understanding of them becomes so radically different. And so, so yeah. And the idea that it was on this platform was fascinating to me. I mean, when I was working on the book of, about Instagram, I was very aware how fugitive Instagram was. And there I was like pouring out my guts on this platform that, you know, Zuckerberg could wake up tomorrow and change the rules of it and the pictures would be gone, you know? So, so that was part of it too. It was, and the idea that there were so many people looking at the pictures that was start. So I was, why was I looking, but I was really interested in why other people were looking. And then when I started getting those kind of messages, from people, then I realized I was in a completely different universe. You know, it wasn't me, curator, putting stuff up on the wall or making pictures on Instagram. Previously, it's like, hey, look at this. People, people were reading into the pictures, and I, you know, I would wake up and I'd be, I'd be in bed at eleven thirty at night when I got that message from the guy from Colorado, and I was shocked that he had just his you know his boyfriend just got murdered next to him and like he could write that to me and write coherent sentences and i'm thinking pictures are doing this and pictures created an amazing community around this and and there would be some days there would be hundreds and hundreds of comments on stuff that i'd put up and people would look at them and they would read them a little bit differently than i meant them to be read and that was interesting too like if i woke up in the morning i was feeling miserable and took a picture at nine in the morning and was feeling like all right at five but put pictures up every day at five o'clock people assumed i was really miserable at five o'clock you know and so it was it was just kind of fascinating so yeah it's like why we look and what and the investment we've got in looking and and stuff and 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 it was about sharing pictures and the, the sense of community um, that got that grew up around this was it, it just extraordinary.
you know, I mean, I and I would walk around, walk around on the street in New York, and people come over to me and say, "You're Marvin, right?" And it's like, you know what? You know, like, oh, I follow you on Instagram. Or people who are in who wrote to me who live around the country come to New York and like we meet each other face to face. You know, and it's just, so it's 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 it was using. I mean, I've always been interested in how photography gets used and, and how it functions and how it's an active agent in our lives. And this was, I was seeing evidence of it every day. So it got me out of bed and it got other people talking about and thinking about stuff and talking about, you realize that people want and need to be talking about these kind of things and that this happened in this way and this place was extraordinary. I'm still amazed that, that this went on. Yeah. I never thought about this before, but your pictures, the picture of Morris in the doorway, uh, because you're talking so much about looking, but how about photographs as like hearing or almost like something of spirit photography, you know, and you're presenting things very publicly, but do they privately for you, do you ever come across one and you almost feel the shiver of something else, like a sound or, do you know what I mean? It's not just about looking, but it's about the inhabiting. Totally. And, Totally. I mean, it, yeah. And you start realizing how pictures encode that kind of stuff. You know, it's what, it, what I said. You know, I look at these 2D pictures and it's 3D. You know, I remember being there. I remember taking the picture. I remember the decisions I made when I, you know, made them. But yeah, I mean, I, the thing was after Murray's died, the first thing, that, one of the things that freaked me out is I had no record of his voice. I mean, he's in a, there's, you know, his messages on the answering machines. I don't save phone messages. So people like you who <laughs> sent me, you know, messages that Maurice left on their phone, or I go listen to Maurice in documentaries because I didn't have a record of that. But um, yeah, they're very, they're really evocative. And that's something that we don't think about that much. And it's probably mostly if you've experienced something, if there's something in a picture that you've experienced somehow, it's probably more vivid. But yeah, it's reading pictures and seeing and looking is about that too. It's about space. That's, you know, it's about time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just a thought. Um, you say that people want to be able to talk about grief and be sure of their experience. But um, so many people have a difficult time talking about this, finding the right words. Where does that feel comfortable and meaningful? And um, so I think you found that photographs are doing the talking <coughs> in a sense, that the connection. It's not a verbal one, but uh, I, who lost my spouse a couple of years ago, started following your Instagram right as you were doing mm. And um, it, it, just the acknowledgement, the recognition, the kinship, um, that I felt was very mean. Didn't have to be in words. Yeah, and it's and it it just hits people. And that and that happens a lot where people say to me, "Oh, it's those photographs of the little things. It's like the photograph of the keys or the photograph of the vest or whatever." And you just remember what it's like to come upon that stuff and have to deal with that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's it's really loaded and it doesn't. Uh, and people just feel it, and it's very hard to articulate. And, and as a culture, we're really bad at talking about grief. And so the photographs made it easier. I mean, they just resonated with, with people, in a, you know, in a certain kind of way, you know. And mostly people were really sweet, you know, in terms of responding. I mean, yeah. I mean, a couple of people did really stupid things, but people do stupid things. <laughs> But, the, but people do stupid things around death all the time and say the wrong things, you know, and, and that's part of what makes people reluctant to do it because people are so worried about worried about it. So, so that's one of the reasons it's interesting to read comments. And a lot of people who go on Instagram would read the comments really carefully and respond to other people's comments. So, yeah, I think they're just kind of they're visual prompts for people. And if you've gone through it, it, re, you know, it resonates because you basically this is stuff you just have in your head and you're by yourself and it's you know all of a sudden somebody else is putting it out there yeah yeah um thank you i i just wanted to say that i i also lost my spouse about the same time and um this 
discovered poetry, you know, all the poetry that's written around grief. And and, uh, and a lot of people who, who go through grief discover, you know, find uh, uh, comfort um, and recognition in writing about grief. And, um, and it's really uncommon to see uh, three grief photographs in this way, in this it's so intimate and personal and and therefore so uh, moving uh, if you go through if, you, if you're going through that um, as I have to see somebody willing to to put that out there yeah it's finding it is, it is a very difficult thing to talk about and it's necessary and it's such a great opening uh, or a way for others to um, at least have a yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And you just, you know, as I said, you just, people lose all kinds of things. People were losing their jobs. People were losing their daily activities. So that kind of sense of loss, that sense of grief was out there in really amorphous ways. And for someone who had an experience like you had or I had, it's one thing. I mean, you know, when people would, and, and then it's just interesting. People, you know, to come and talk and, they're apologetic about what kinds of grief they're feeling. Well, I didn't lose my husband. I lost, you know, my father died. My mother died. They were 90. They were 100. But I feel bad. And you know, it's like, it's okay. You know, it's not, you feel bad. You know, it's like, it's, it, but it's just, and putting it out there, I'm thinking more and more people are talking about it now. There's more, there's more talk about grief. There are more people on Instagram who have uh, done pictures around it. Um, Tanya Marcuse, who's here, was taking pictures of her mother who was, dying and you know i remember looking at those on instagram and that gave me courage to do what i was doing and i think you start to realize it's okay to talk about this you know and 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 that they were personal images made a difference you know i was sitting and watching the news and i'm looking at the refrigerator truck morgues and you know you're looking at politicians or whatever and here's something that's very personal and i think that touched people it, it, it meant something to people but i do think you know it's, it's there's there's more talk now i think covid changed us and i think it changed culture but yeah yeah i hope this is a question um, that was really sweet what you just said but um i keep, i keep thinking back to the picture you showed from um memorial photography the memorial photograph and I've always been sort of dumbfounded that it seemed like from the very beginning, photography and death were kind of totally coupled. And somehow as death and illness sort of moved into out of the realm of the domestic and rituals around death kind of crumbled and fractured and there's, you know, we don't quite know what to do anymore. Yeah. Um, and so I'm just thinking about what you're doing and the artist statement, like the more specific it is, the more general it'll be, like the power and specificity of your chronicle, of your grief and the way it has opened up to this bigger sort of in the James Baldwin um, passage way and has resonated so powerfully. So I guess my question is about that kind of remarriage of, of photography and, and, and death and what you what your thoughts are about that here. Uh, you couldn't not I couldn't not think about it. You know, one of the early shows in the 1980s I did uh, one of the first big shows of medical photography in an arts institution and they were all around daguerreotype pictures of you know deceased people when i was at the smithsonian and doing photography it changes everything one of the people i reached out to was a woman who had started an organization called now i lay me down to sleep who went out to photograph parents with their stillborn children before their kids were buried and those are the kind those are the kind of things that people you know don't do that i don't want to see that whatever and the parents really wanted those pictures it was them with their child it was the last picture they would have so yeah, I think people, just medicine has kind of moved that out of our day-to-day -day experience. And uh, yeah, and death is, uh, 
it's not personal. It's about the war and violence and crime or whatever. But this private stuff um, has very different meaning. And uh, you think about mourning jewelry. Victorians wore mourning jewelry for you know years after people died. So um, yeah, it's that weird connection. And and you know you kind of think oh the the it's it's what's past and what's present. You know, in making pictures. Or you think about the way we make pictures now where we don't even have them to hold on to. And it's just like, it's like looking at them on Instagram. It's like, it's done, you know, it's over, it's over, it's over. So these pictures like took on so much meaning. You know, when I describe going through my hard drive, looking for Maurice and pictures, it, I do it. I still do it. Do you know, did I miss one? You know, and it's, and it's the kind of thing where we, we really didn't take a lot of pictures of each other. And I'm really sorry we didn't, you know, cause that's, you know, that's kind of, what you're left with, you know, what it means now that you can use AI and, you know, create 3D, you know, bring dead people back to life and have them speak to you in their own voice is the next turn in this little imaging scenario. But I, I didn't have that. I didn't have that to play with, you know, for this. Yeah. But that's, I mean, that's, you know, that's happening too. So I don't know what that's going to do to morning when you can, have coffee and talk to a hologram of somebody who died. I don't know. It's, it's wild. Yeah. 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 I just want to say it's like there's some, both there's a few words that haven't been used that are just like really direct to like why this project is so moving to me. And one of them is vulnerable and validation. And, you know, it's it, like for somebody who is so incredibly gifted and in speaking about one you know, in general, yeah. to talk about, to sort of, you know, reveal your liver, like offer yourself in, in like your truth as, you know, and, and it's interesting because the question about the, um, the helicopters in that moment, it's like, as, as your former student, it, it's like one doesn't think of you going through the day sort of snapping pictures when thinks about you um, thinking about pictures in a formal way. And it is possible that, I mean, it, it's a big risk and it's a wonderful offering for you to kind of open that, like open the veil, use that moment of, of being, you know, having the veil. You spoke in the very beginning about the veil that falls. Yeah. Great, yeah. Open, uh, that yeah. I mean, vulnerability is really in it's interesting to put it out there, you know. And, and like, I'm very Maurice was very meticulous about the way he looked and the way he dressed, and you know, wouldn't wouldn't go out unless he was like ready to be seen, you know. And and so I I would go through pictures, and I you know, there's part of me thinking, oh, Maurice wouldn't like this picture. His hair's <laughs> fucked up, you know. <laughs> And then I would really, I would have this kind of, you know, this little argument with myself, like, do I do this or don't I do this? And it was like, how many, and you know, I'm, the car is like talking about vulnerable. The car is like one of the most, for some reason, it's one of the most vulnerable places. So I'm often crying when I'm in the car and trying to take pictures of me crying when I'm in the car is like, whoa, I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> and, and how many times do I need to do this? But and, 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 you know, do, you know, do I care what I look like in these pictures? And yeah, you just kind of think about that. And you just kind of, it, it goes in and out the window. I mean, I became, when, when more and more people started looking at this, I started realizing, oh, people are looking at these, right? And that, and, and then I thought, all right, is that going to change what I'll do or not do? And in some ways it does. And in some ways it does. It depends on the day, you know, it depends on what, if I wake up and, like I went to the gas station right the other day, which is across the street from the motel, right, and the temple where the helicopter was. And I don't, I won't go there. It's like I, don't, I just don't want to see it. And I was going back to, driving back to Manhattan. And I'm putting gas in the car, and I turned around. And I looked. And I thought, oh shit! I'm, like, I'm looking at this. I don't want to be looking at this. And I thought, am I going to take a picture of it or am I not? Gonna? And I did, you know, and I put it up. And because it's just the mundaneness, right? Here's the place where this guy's life ended. And it's, uh, you know, it's a repurposed motel. So, and and I just felt really vulnerable when it happened and I put it up. So, it, you know, yeah, 
it's an it's an interesting that's you know what i'm saying instagram is like the branding of happiness it's like this happy place and every day i was putting up this stuff and i thought people are not who's gonna look at this like why will people look at this but they did because i think we all and what not you know, maybe not everybody but a lot a lot of people feel this stuff and don't have the opportunity to deal with it and all of a sudden they did i'm fascinated that people look every day I mean, that's kind of incredible to me. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think those, I think you're posting all of these promoted um, an awareness of trying to have a language about it because you couldn't help but confront these and then somehow, in, even if it was just in your head, thinking about it. And that's what you were saying earlier is that people don't know how to talk about it or really think about it. And it's often a very uncomfortable subject. But I think you completely superseded any of that with this. And for that, I'm grateful. Yeah, well, thanks. I mean, people do weird stuff around it. We've got a friend whose kid died of cancer, right? And she put up pictures of her kid dying as the kid was dying. She put up the pictures on Instagram of the kid dead, right? And I remember sitting in bed with Maurice at night, like looking at these pictures thinking, what the fuck? This is like wild. And and then she took them down, right? And then a year later, they went back up again. And it's you just feel the need to deal with it. Um, and, and people deal with it in different kinds of ways. And I guess, yeah, it's like the decorum of posting and Instagram. It's like, what's, you know, whose day am I going to ruin if I put up a sad picture, you know? And then I, you know, I didn't care. None of these are that, you know, not messing with people's heads in, in, in ways. But yeah, it's being vulnerable was, um, that was wild. I'd never done that before. That's not what my work is. That's not what I do, you know? And all of a sudden I had no choice. Yeah. Yeah. I have two questions, actually. One is similar to Tanya's, but uh, maybe I want to know something a little deeper into that question, which is, uh, um, I'm a photographer, too, and I, much of my work is around grief, mm -hmm. and I, I'm just wondering for you, is um, the experience, so I started taking pictures around the same time I became a photographer when I was a teenager, so I, that was the first experience I had with grief, and that was my way of expressing it. So I feel fortunate to for photography in that way. Um, and then um, and then that's just been a stream of loss and grief um, through other lives lost in my life. And I'm just wondering for you personally, um, do you look do you, when you take when you take pictures now, um, do you carry that with you in your images regardless if it is of Murray and or not just that but I, I mean do you see I mean for me I everything I take a picture of now is has loss in it um even if I'm taking a picture of, of my daughter who's you know in college or whatever you know everything has loss now and so um I'm just wondering for you do you do you feel that in your in your picture making and your in your pictures now. That's my first question. Second question is this. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get this out. Second question is because of course, I mean, this is like a really wonderful thing that you've done and I'm so glad to be here today. But um, are these pictures about you, Murray, or the relationship? or all of the above, one, two, or three, A, B, or C. I'm, I'm just saying for you, like, are these pictures, are they, what, what are they? Are they one of those, all of those? And can you, can you pinpoint that? Um. Those are really good questions. I mean, the, the, so the first, the first question is when you go through an experience that was as dramatic and unexpected as uh, you know, what I went through and a lot of people go through, you realize your life has changed, right? That's it. It's like, 
you, you know, it's like if I wake up, some mornings I wake up and think, oh, I got this under control, right? I got this grief thing under control and I'm fine for an hour, you know, or something. And then I'll be, it happened the other day. I just, you know, it was, it was my birthday. I spent it with friends. I had a really nice time. Wake up the next day. I think I'm doing okay, right? I'm, and then, bam, <laughs> you know, I wasn't. So you don't, it, you have no control over that, you know, and you just kind of learn to live with it and it changes you and the pictures, you know, every once in a while I'll take a picture of something silly. And I think, should I put that up on Instagram, you know, or is, is that like not, you know, should I not be doing this? Should I go back to my old pre, you know, pre COVID Instagram identity, you know, but, but, um, no, you kind of can't. You're changed. You're you're changed. And and in the to your second question, it's all of the above. Yeah, it's like you know whose story is it's it's our story. You know, and one of the things that was interesting about doing it too is people have written to me saying that you know it's you, it's a gay story. It's you know you don't see this that often either. So I was certainly aware of that when I started doing this that I'm putting out, you know, this relationship story that's a little bit different than what many people might often see. So um, so that was, didn't drive it, but it was another factor. So yeah, it's, it's it Murray's the lie, but it really is. I mean, I really truly feel that. Um, yeah, and it's about us. It's about a relationship. And that's, and that's where, you know, I'll put up a picture, like a picture of uh, the surveillance picture of us at Target, you know, and I love that picture. And I put that picture up and that didn't get a lot of likes that day, but, you know, that, <laughs> but, but, that, but I thought, oh, this is, this, this, you know, this is, that's what we did that day. I remember going to Target. I remember what we did, you know, I walked through spaces. I mean, I went to, Ikea the other day for the first time in Paramus, you know, where we used to go on the way upstate and I hadn't been there since Maurice died. And I thought, oh, great. I like Ikea. I always like going to Ikea. It's like going to a museum. It's like, you know, let's look at design, I'm, you know, whatever. And I walked in there and within two minutes, I was like, oh, shit. Like, I haven't been here since Maurice died. I remember this, 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 this. And it was weird, you know. So um, everything, it's kind of double. It's, yeah, so it's, it's, so it's me, it's him. It's, you know, it's, it's all of the above. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, I mean, as you been so far, like, there's things that you're conveying about grief through images that you can't put into words. But I know you've also been reading a ton, and you quoted Denise Riley and John Didier and James Baldwin and Medici. So I'm just wondering, as as you've been doing this, you know, the last couple of years, has what you're reading influenced the images you're creating? Has have the images you've been posting influenced the way you read about grief? What's the back and forth between, you know, you, you pick up, you've really been researching grief. Yeah. yeah. Well, you do. I mean, it's why people looking at the pictures feel it, you know, a little bit and have a, you know, it, it resonates with them. But yeah, when you have something like this hit you, you don't know what, you don't know what to do. You don't know how you're going to you don't know what to do. So you're looking for any help you can get and you go read stuff. And, um, and there were some extraordinary things, you know, that one with Denise Riley's book about uh, how time stops was unbelievable because I, you know, after Maurice died, I was like, literally, well, it happened to many of us. You didn't know one day from the next and whatever, but the void of it was incredible. So you're trying to find people who can express what you feel because you don't, you, you know, you kind of know what you're feeling, but it's hard to, communicate it to uh, certainly to other people, but even to yourself. So you're always looking for stuff. And um, yeah, some people are, were very helpful. Yeah. Some of the stuff I read was, was very helpful. Some of it's kind of, you know, junky, but you know, it's like self-helpy stuff. I mean, you know, and, and, and the mis the misinformation around grief is wild. I mean, you know, and you're very sensitive, right? When you're in this period, I mean, I mean, the the thing that got me 
furious one day is when um, it's a photograph I didn't show today. It's a photograph of a box of twist ties, like red garbage bag twist ties. And at one point I said, we needed them up at the house to just close up garbage bags. So Murray's bought a lot of stuff online. So he bought a box of twist ties, but he bought a box of 2000 of them. <laughs> so they come to the house and I look at it, I'm you know, laughing. I mean, this is like ridiculous. And I said to him, we're not going to live long enough to use these. And, you know, that was that and all very funny. And then he's dead. And I open the kitchen drawer and there's the box of the twist ties. And so I put up, I make a picture of the twist ties in the kitchen drawer and I put it up. And someone who will remain nameless, who is both a somebody who writes about journalism and photography and communication and is a shrink, right? I wrote, I, I tell a story in the caption about the twist ties, you know, and I said, you know, I said to Marisa, you're not going to, we're not going to live long enough. Joke's on me, I said. And so then this shrink photography expert writes back to me and says, I'm really surprised that eight months after Maurice's death, this is where you're at. <laughs> and I thought, oh, shit, this is like, this is ridiculous. You know, like chewed his head off and, you know, he came back very apologetic, but you, you know, you're looking, you know, you're looking on the one hand for other people to help you figure stuff out. And then there's the people yeah, who don't know what to say or say the wrong thing words. That's why I put up that grief definition as words are, I don't know. They're weird. That's why it's why those, that those emails just were, it was horrific. That was hard. That was horrible. Cause everybody really was thinking about Maurice or people who loved him and were close to him and wrote lovely things about him. And I'm reading it and I'm thinking, I can't deal with this, you know, kind of thing. So making pictures and maybe that's me, you know, if I were a writer of a different kind, maybe I'd be writing different kinds of stuff, but I couldn't, I couldn't deal with that kind of stuff. So making pictures made sense to me. Yeah. 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 Doing is also keeping Maurice's work alive. Totally. Um, for me, you know, I'm just thinking about how your images, you know, you, you're saying why we look, and so much of what Maurice did was what I was looking at. And what did that photo that was taken on this moment tell us about, you know, what was happening with the mundane? Yeah. You know, the mundane that he often talked about in racism. Yeah. All of those things that you talked about, and then the community that you're creating around your work, around something that we don't talk about. And Maurice has been doing that, you know, elder. Well, it, it, that's, I mean, that's a really interesting point. Maurice was trained as an art historian. Maurice's PhD was on Robert Morris and minimalism. And, and when he started getting involved in race and representation images, photography changed what he did and what he thought. And that's, and so that's part of this too. So yeah, this is kind of his work. Also, we used to talk about this stuff all the time, you know, and um, yeah, that's another thing. Part of me is like, he's dead. I want people to know about Maurice. I want people to think about Maurice every day. Yeah. 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 I'm even thinking about, um, you know, your images of people crying. And I remember in an interview with Maurice, and I interviewed him and he cried about the Gordon Park image <laughs> and what it brought to mind for him. Right. And it, it just all seems yeah. so yeah. 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 Most of your images are about kind of charging the memory, connecting with the memory. But um, the memories that can be very paradoxical, of course, and you all had the experience that, you know, watching your children grow up or looking at past vacations. I find often I don't remember things that weren't photographed. The photographs replace the memories. And I wonder about that question in relation to this project. There are a couple of friends that have had children die. And they said they, what they hate the most is when people try to make them feel better by saying, you'll get over this, you'll get past this. The last thing in the world somebody wants to hear. And do you have that feeling that the photography cuts both ways, that it, it, it's supplanting it in the way that John Didion, the, the last line of the Didion quote? Yeah, I mean, 
That's that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, for I mean, for me, it keeps it real, keeps it alive. You know, whatever. I mean, I I I worked with Nan Golden for years. I mean, I, Nan and I worked together for a, a ten years, and I produced the Ballad of Sexual Dependency, the slideshow, and the book. And so we talked about this stuff a lot. And I just did an interview with her and asked her to, you know, in the, in the text for the book, you know, she said she made pictures so she wouldn't forget, you know, and she would keep people alive. And she just looked at me and said, I don't believe it anymore. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it, I don't know, it goes, it goes both ways. I mean, I can't imagine not having them. I can't imagine having to some, it's like the voice thing. It's like, I have to remember, I have to, it's really hard to remember what Maurice's voice was like. So, but if I didn't have the pictures, that would be, wow, I can't imagine it. So, um, yeah, they work, they don't work. And yeah, yeah. But you heard those voice message machine, machine messages that you said people send you. And those things, you know, they go off like hand grenades the first time you hear them. You know, if you're not a It's like, it's like it's from voice from the other side. Yeah, it's like, it's just freaky. Yeah, yeah. But eventually they become part of the memory bank and they lose that. I suppose, you know, I mean, that's why when everybody was saying, may the memory be a blessing, may the memory be a blessing, may the memory be a blessing, I was so mad at them. I just like, stop saying that. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's awful. It feels terrible. The memories are bad. It's not a blessing. And then, you know, it's that the, the person who wrote to me who said, well, you know, one day I woke up and things were different, you know. So, you know, I'm not there yet, you know. And, and that's the other thing. It's like this process, like people saying, oh, you know, you'll feel better. You'll, you'll get up. You don't, you know, you, you kind of learn how to incorporate this into your life in a certain kind of way. And that's the whole Pauline Boss book is about that. This idea that, that there's closure, you know, and that it's, that it's, you know, something that's kind of sold to people as a concept, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily happen. I mean, there are certain cases where you experience grief and death and like, yeah, people die, you know, I mean, somebody actually wrote that to me in a comment one day that like flipped me out, just ready to comment to something. I said, yeah, people die every day. Oh. And I was stunned, but you know, but you know, and, and I think there's a different kind of loss. Like there's a, you know, friend of mine, a photographer whose kid died, daughter died in a car accident. And it's like, I watch what she's doing on Instagram and you know how she's trying to deal with it. And it's just, it's, you know, it's look, grief is grief is different. And there's a part of me that's thinking, all right, this is three and a half years out already. And it's not like I'm over this. It's not going away. I'm still putting it out there. People are still looking at it. So there's, I don't know. I think there's, you need to, you just experience it however you experience it. But I think there's maybe a little more, generosity on the public after what we went through maybe and i think you know you look at current events with what's you know going on all around the world and maybe people are being a little bit nicer to each other i don't know maybe yeah in some situations yeah so, yeah i just want to quickly say something this idea of photographs keeping people alive or keeping memory alive I went to concentration camp a few years ago and I brought my camera and I had two really powerful, sort of maybe contradictory feelings. On one hand, for the first time, I really understood like, the importance of the place, like the ghost, the physical place and its relationship to memory. But I was absolutely unable to take a photograph when I was there. I mean, it was just like, it seemed like a transgression, like you know, something that wouldn't in any way capture the, the memories. And it didn't seem like, despite having been told the story all my life by, by my parents and family, it didn't seem like my story somehow. Yeah. Like, and I think one of the things that's so powerful about your project is that it is your voice and it, 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 and it is your story and it's your story and so forth. And it exists in a context Everybody, Instagram, where everyone's telling the story, but it's really it's one heavily invested with fiction and artifice. You know, it's, it's a very one-sided story, and I think that's part of the power of the project is that it is where it exists. It, yeah. 
Yeah, and I think also to live it is different than to look at it. I'd sit in bed, like I was saying, watch the news and watch the photographs and see how COVID was being represented in the media. And, you know, I was living a different experience. And it just, you know, makes you realize what photographs can do and can't do. Or, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've often been kind of haunted with a, a Sally Man's uh, idea that it, it, the picture uh, has a way of uh, draining out um, what the memory has the ability to do. Um, do you ever concern yourself in that area? Because, I mean, I mean for me, I fill in with photographs um, and then the other senses sometimes fall away where like um, in terms of like how you remember how our memory works um, when we replace it with a photograph I'm just curious have you have, have you <coughs> um, experienced that or have you explored that at all hmm. no no I no I mean I just keep wishing there were more pictures that's you know it's like, why didn't, you know, why didn't I take more pictures? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.